our president, President Trump, uh, declared opioid use as a, a, a national emergency today. And it is that. And so, um, sure there's people listening this evening who is perhaps struggling with addiction or has someone in their family, some friends, some co-worker, some neighbor that they are aware of that is struggling with addiction. In the midst of tragic news, that news being four people in our state die every day from overdose, 1,404 in the state of Kentucky last year, that number continues to increase. In the midst of bad news, there's good news. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Good news is treatment does work. Families are healed. Uh, life becomes all that God intended it for be, to be, even for those that are in addiction. The two people that are going to share tonight are two people that um, I just respect so very much. Uh, there are two people who have powerful testimonies of God's transforming work in their lives. Uh, Eddie is uh, our outside operations director for Isaiah House. Uh, we are a substance, uh, residential substance abuse treatment facility in Willisburg, Kentucky. Uh, Joanna Early works in our public relations department. But there are two people who love the Lord and two people that are used the Lord every day uh, by their life's example to be a source of encouragement uh, to those struggling in addiction. So, I'm very proud to introduce uh, Eddie and Joanna Irvin. Thank you, Brother Mike. Um, so, I guess the way we'll, we'll go about this, Joanna and I have gave our testimony time and time again, and uh, uh, you know, it's always somewhat similar, like it's ever changing, uh, but. Uh, the basic part of it is always there, but I guess you want me to go. Uh, so, uh, and we have fun with each other, so if we cut up with each other as long as, as we do this, bear in mind we've been married for almost 25 years, and we had that, I guess, that right to do that now. Um, but that's a testimony in itself. Um, so uh, when I was about, and, and I, I don't like to talk about the bad things because that takes away from what God has done uh, and, and, and my time to talk about how good God is. But without telling you some of the bad, it's hard to understand how much God has worked in our lives. Amen. Um, so, in a nutshell, or in, in a quick part of it here, I'm, I'm going to go over the, the early parts of it. Okay, and you jump in whenever you want to talk about your, your end of it. But uh, I was raised in a good home. Uh, it wasn't a Christian home. Uh, my dad was a functioning alcoholic. He provided for us. He took care of us. He was a coal miner for 30 years. He, he, uh, we didn't want for anything. We had, we had what we wanted. Uh, I was blessed as an athlete uh, all throughout my early years. Uh, uh, that same blessing was somewhat of a downfall for me uh, because I always ran with an older crowd. And because I started running with an older crowd, I started doing a lot of the things that an older crowd was doing. And by the time I was 15, I was already dabbling with alcohol and, and uh, marijuana. And, uh, and as, as I got a little bit older, uh, things progressed. Uh, one thing that I, I talk about somewhat at times is how I became the older crowd that was leading some of the younger people along uh, in the same bad direction. Um, I went off to college. Uh, we'll jump in here at some point. Not back. Where you going all that? Okay, go ahead. Uh, a 
little bit of my background is I was raised in a Christian home. Uh, we went to church every time the doors was open. Lots of love in my home. Um, so uh, very blessed in that way. Um, I went into high school and was known as the good girl. Don't ever offer Joanna drugs or alcohol because that's not her thing. She will not partake. Um, by the time this, our senior year rolled around, um, I guess I was kind of tired of being the good girl. So I started dabbling a little bit and drinking and smoking marijuana. That didn't go very far. Um, after we graduated, Eddie and I were high school sweethearts. And after we graduated, we parted and went our separate ways. And, and during that time, uh, the summer of my uh, high school graduation, um, I started seeing a young man and got pregnant. Um, so I'm 18 years old and I have a child out of wedlock, which was devastating to my family because good little Christian girls just didn't do that. Um, our sophomore year in college, Amy and I reconnected, uh, right? Our sophomore year. Um, and uh, we kind of done what college kids do, I guess, and that's uh, going to the bars on. Uh, the weekends and drinking and partying uh, to some degree and go ahead Ed, and chime in there. <laughs> uh, well, I, and I was the lead culprit in, in a lot of that because uh, I, I was uh, I was going to college. I was playing college baseball, um, and I was doing what all the seemed like all the college kids did. But what I didn't realize was there was a, a whole group of college kids that were devoted Christians and doing the right thing, but that just wasn't my scene. Um, and during that time, before Joanna and I reconnected, I had developed a cocaine, and, and I'm going to say this because Mark Palm will get a kick out of this, but I always say I developed a bad cocaine habit. And every time I say it in front of Mark Palm, he says, well, is there a good cocaine habit? <laughs> mm. uh, but I, I developed that cocaine habit. Joanna and I reconnected. She had she had her oldest son at that time. Um, and what she didn't know until just one couple years ago is that her coming back into my life and, and Logan, our son, um, helped me to, to kick the cocaine. Mm. I just put it down one day. Um, that's not to say I didn't dabble in it a little bit later on, but we both did. But, uh, but I mean, I was really deep in this, and, uh, and I put it down. Now, I didn't put everything down. That was my problem. But I put that down. And, uh, and she didn't know that until just a, a few years ago, but they, they were my blessing that, at that point, too, uh, because I was going down a path that was probably going to head to uh, destruction long before I actually went down that same path again. Um, but later on, uh, uh, I, was, I, I ended up getting drafted by the Kansas City Royals at one point. Um, things didn't work out there, I got hurt. Um, and God just had a different plan. And part of that plan was Joanna being a part of my life. Um, we ended up married uh, in 1993. Um, Mom came two more babies. Two more children, beautiful children come along. Uh, we were blessed uh, with all the worldly things. Uh, I had a, a job that basically was almost a six-figure job. We had, home, we had two different homes at one point. Uh, well, we had whatever we wanted. Our kids had whatever they wanted. Mm -hmm. But we had something that, or we didn't have something that should have been there all along. And we didn't have the Lord. Um, so all those other things really didn't matter. Now back then to us, or to me anyway, she knew better because she was raised differently than I was. But to me, I thought it, everything was great. I thought the world was right where it was supposed to be. And I always had a void. Yeah. And for years and years and years, um, 
her family and her, you know, they, they would say, you know, you need to go to church with us. You need to go to church with us. And my standpoint on that always was, is look, I, I'm not going to go to church on Sunday and live a different life mm -hmm. Monday through Saturday. Mm -hmm. When I go, I'm going to be committed. And I'm, I, it's going to be, you know, with everything in me. So all through that whole process of going through college, us getting married, um, the addiction part of, of things were still in play. Uh, I was always, I, I, I always drank, I always was smoking some kind of marijuana and uh, just different things. Um, and in 1999, I was in a bad car accident. Um, and and I was diagnosed with lupus yeah. mm -hmm. after our third son was born. He was about well, six months old, I think, when I was diagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of when things all started um, to really go downhill. What I didn't know is that Eddie had been prescribed Percocet, mm -hmm. and uh, what he was doing on the road uh, was using the Percocet, and a friend of mine had introduced me to Oxycontin, and what he didn't know is that I was doing the Oxycontin at home. And so for about four months, three or four months, I kept that hid from him. And I thought if I can just talk him into doing what I'm doing, uh, it's gonna, if we're both in it, it'll be a lot better for me. That was my thinking in it. Um, so I finally talked to him and um, he was never, I thought at the time, a big pill taker, and I didn't know that he had already been dabbling in it himself. So um, we were having the drug dealer come to the house and deliver massive amounts of dope to us. Um, and that went on for how many years? So the money ran out. <laughs> well, until we went a different direction and started. The IV. Yeah, um, everything just continued to progress like most most drug addictions do. And, uh, uh, we we went from doing a little to doing a lot to doing un, unearthly amounts of, of pills uh, in just a day's time uh, to uh, graduating what people want to call graduating to using needles. Mm. Um, something that we never thought. We never do. Well. I mean, I've had blood drawn before all that happened and passed completely out. I was scared to death of needles. Uh, never thought we would have went down that road. But we did. Um, and before long, all those things I told you a few minutes ago that we had, the homes, the money, the cars, uh, we were basically living in an apartment and projects with no electricity. Um, and that's kind of in a nutshell. There's a lot of story in between that, but uh, but that's where it led to. So we had lost all those worldly things. And then what it started to do and was doing in that whole process too was it was starting to take its toll on our relationship. So like most drug addicts, when the money runs out, um, you find other ways to get it. And 99.9% .9 of the time, that includes some kind of theft. Mm -hmm. So, I'm gonna go through this real quick. <laughs> uh, I've done three years in prison. I've done a, com a combined total of 60 months in county jails or prison, uh, both. I still currently, to this day, have a 15 year prison sentence hanging over me that I'm on probation for for about seven more months because I want to get into some of the jail parts um, because that's a, that's, part, that's a big part of us. Well, during that time, during, uh, let me go backwards. Let me, during the time that I was in prison, Joanna and I finally separated. Um, and she couldn't deal with me, I couldn't deal with her, we were toxic. Because when we were together, we just, we hurt each other in some form or fashion. So, 
I've been arrested a total of 14 times. And each time that uh, I was arrested, I look back on it now and I realize God was saving my life. At the time, it didn't feel like a blessing. But now I look at it and I say, each time that I was, I was behind that door or behind those bars, uh, that was God's way of saving me. And one particular time that, that, that I talk about a lot is I was in my living room one night. Joanna had left. She got mad and left. And I dropped to my knees. And again, I told you all, I was not raised in church. I didn't, uh, I just, I, I knew enough to be dangerous. I didn't know the ins and outs. Um, but I dropped to my knees and I said, God, you've got to do something, please. I said, uh, I said, either go ahead and take me on out of this world or do something. Well, lo and behold, two weeks later, I was in jail and I stayed there for the next 28 months. And I didn't realize it until now or a few months or years ago that that was God's way of saving me. Because had I not, had He not put me there, which I, you know, I put myself there, but had had that not happened, um, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to anybody today. And there's a part that I'm going to get to here in a little bit because I'm going to tell them about the story about when we went to Harlan County that day. Uh, uh, and, and you know, every time that I've cried out, God showed up. Amen. And the one thing that people need to understand is when things seem their darkest, that's when God's light shows through the brightest. Amen. And I have seen that and lived that multiple times now. So, you gotta get in here at some point. Um, <laughs> uh, so anyway, her, Joanna and I, we separated. I was in and out of prison. <laughs> Take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I was in prison. <laughs> yeah. We had separated and um, gone our separate ways and me and Eddie, even though we were apart, we always found a way to check on one another. Um, there is a, a connection between us that I can't even explain. We were apart, but we all we always wanted what was best for each other. Um, during that time, um, I thought I had cleaned up my act, so to say, a little bit. I had gotten off the needle and started um, college again and went right back, um, found myself back in a bad situation and was doing massive amounts of drugs and, and told myself that I was okay because I wasn't using the needle anymore. Mm. And so, um, there came a time that uh, Eddie decided that he needed to get help, and you can pick up there because that was uh, when your court case started up. Yeah, uh, and that's one part I wanted to talk about. So I, I got arrested again. Um, I was on probation, and I was looking at going and doing a lot of jail time, and I was waiting for what they call a revocation hearing. Normally that means you're going to prison. And again, one night in a jail cell, uh, and, and men that's been in jail, they, they won't let another man see them cry. You have to toughen up when you're in there. Uh, you just can't break that. Um, but I went to the shower one night, and I cried like a baby. And I said, God, please give me one more chance. And I was supposed to be picked up two days later, to be transported to a different county for that revocation hearing while I was waiting on charges to be brought on me in that county. And for whatever reason, they didn't come pick me up. You all figure out why here in a minute. So for three more months, I sat in that jail cell wondering why they didn't come pick me up. And in the meantime, God started to move. I was offered probation 
out of that county based on me going to long-term treatment. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got that worked out, then the other county found out mm -hmm. and they agreed to allow that also. Mm -hmm. So I was a free man again, waiting to find a treatment center to get into to start my treatment plan. And in the process, uh, I go back to court one day and my, my, my attorney tells me, she said, I've got good news. You don't have to go to treatment. They're mm. just going to probate this. Wow. And I said, well, that is good news. But I need treatment. Mm. And I'm going anyway. So in 2011, uh, I came across the Isaiah House. And I actually, when I left Harlan County to come to treatment, I left Harlan County with intentions of starting my life over without her. Mm. A fresh start. A new start. I knew that the Isaiah House was a Christ Center facility and that's what I wanted mm. because I knew that's what I needed. And I made the decision when I went there that like I told you all before, if I ever did, went down that road, I was going to be committed. And I completely committed. When that happened, uh, Joanna was still struggling and I knew she was struggling. Every day that I seen her or ran across her or something like that, I could see it. Uh, I would tell her I knew she was struggling and, and she would she was in denial so bad it wasn't funny. Uh, but when the day that I got to the Isaiah house, I made a determination that I wanted our kids to have their mother and father sober. Mm -hmm. I wanted our kids to know who we really were. Whether we were together or not, they deserve to have their mother and father. Mm -hmm. So I started praying a prayer every night. And I prayed this prayer. Every night I lay down in bed, the same thing over and over. And I prayed, I said, God, please, let Joanna see a change in me. Give me six months and let her see a change in me and let her want that for herself. Mm -hmm. So I started going through the program continue to go through the program. I continue to pray that prayer every night. I can continue to do everything I could do to learn more about the Lord and become more obedient. And, and, and my faith started growing. Uh, there was things that happened during this time that uh, a lot of people probably would have just folded. Um, but my faith was strong at that time. And uh, I started getting to go home. And when I was coming home, my kids knew I was coming home, so she automatically knew I was coming home. So I would see her, and I never really go, did go to her and preach at her or anything like that. I just tried to encourage her and show her the love of Jesus. So that's, that's all I knew to do. So I, I come into the Isaiah house on May the 20th, 2011. And uh, I got to go home the weekend, actually for some reason, the weekend before Thanksgiving. Um, and walked in the door to see my mom and, and just for a quick tidbit her and my mom did not like each other at this point okay? <laughs> at she's all. my best friend man. <laughs> <laughs> so I go into my mom's house I haven't been there no more than an hour and a half two hours and I get a phone call from her dad and her dad says can you please come to my house well we grew up a mile from each other. I said, yeah, I'll be right there. I get down there and he said, Joanna's in the bedroom. She, she needs to talk to you. And I walk in and uh, uh, she's sitting on the bed with tears running down her face and she looks up at me and she says, I need help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So immediately I knew what I needed to do. I've been at the Isaiah Hospital long enough. I've learned enough. I knew I got to get her out of here and I got to get her out now. So I called Mark LaPalm and I said, Mark, this is the situation. I need to get out of here. I need to bring her with me and blah, blah, blah. Well, luckily, we had her aunt and uncle that lived in Harrodsburg at the time. Mark didn't know that. Mark just said, bring her. And we were going to figure it out as we went. And got down here and my mom was not real happy that I told her that I was taking Joanna back with me and we were leaving. <laughs> So, um, we get in the car, we leave, 
the next day, I, the first phone call I made, and Mike can attest to this because he probably knows better than anybody. The first call I made, I got her in. That is unheard of. That's a God thing. That's God opening doors and making ways when there is no way. So on November the 20th, 2011, six months to the day that I started praying that prayer, mm. Joanna went into treatment. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. And we continued our treatment and went through it, and I'm going to let you pick up and tell them where I screwed up. <laughs> six months and uh, when I got there I actually rededicated my heart to the Lord um, before we pulled out of Harlan County that day um, I got to the treatment center and I just began to pour my heart out to the Lord because like I said I grew up in a Christian home I knew all about Jesus I had seen his power and how he can heal and deliver um, so I felt a little bit emotional And deliverance is what I received. Um, I don't identify myself as a recovering drug addict. I am a child of God, and my God delivers Amen. and sets free. Amen. That's what He does. Amen. Um, and I also began to pray healing over myself. And I said, Lord, you raised the dead. I said, there's nothing you can't do. And I don't accept this diagnosis anymore. And from that day forward, I have not had an attack of lupus. Um, every test that I've had, uh, I don't have it anymore. There's no trace of it. Amen. So my God is a healer, and He's a deliverer, and He's sure. a restorer. Um, he's my hope. He's my everything. So we get through our treatment and my little husband has us a house and everything set up waiting on me when I get out. Um, everything is going wonderful uh, for about a year. Uh, he's working hard. Um, I start working at the Isaiah house and I start noticing some changes and, and he would come home from work and not out in the recliner and my mind knew but my heart didn't want to to receive what was really going on. Um, and he would say, oh no, I'm just tired. I mean, you know all the long hours that I work, I'm just tired. And so this went on for a little bit and I started noticing, my son started noticing some things missing from home. Um, so I told him one day, I said, there's some things that Bub's missing. I said, and I'm getting ready to call the police department. I said, and I'm going to file a report. So if you don't know anything about it, you need to, to tell me about it now. And he was like, oh, no. No, I think you should go ahead and call. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, I know you did it. And you're, you're willing to, to go serve 15 minutes. See what drugs will do to you, man. <laughs> So we did. We called and I made a report and I told the officer, I said, I think I have a good idea of who done it and you might want to start looking at the pawn shops around town. <laughs> and that's what he did and yes, it was Ed and so I kicked him out. Um, not that I didn't love him, I was hurt um, and I knew that we couldn't go through this mm. like this again. Um, and I didn't want to enable his behavior. And I thought maybe that would wake him up a little bit. So I kicked him out and uh, had to send my kids back to Harlan County to live uh, with their parents for a little while until I could figure out how we were going to get this thing straightened out. And I just began to pray and seek the Lord. And, and honestly, I was a little bit angry because I didn't understand why the Lord would allow all this to happen and things to fall apart again when I had done everything that I knew to do. I had stayed in the Word. I prayed over my family. I went to church. I was being faithful to Him and I didn't understand. Um, so eventually they um, picked Eddie up, but before that I had... Um, no, you were already in jail. No. No. Before they picked him up, I went home one weekend. And um, it was on a Sunday morning, and I was getting ready for church, and my sweet little daddy followed me through the house, and we chatted a little bit, and I told him, I said, after church is over, I said, I'll 
be back and I'll run to the store and get some stuff and I'll cook dinner. So church was over and I came back in and I walked through my mom and dad's house and I went to the back bedroom and my dad loved to tinker with things and so he would sit in his chair at the desk or at the corner of his bed and he would have things laid out and he would tinker and fix things and so I seen all of his stuff laid out and then I turned and looked to the corner and he was sitting in his chair with his head back and I thought well he's fell asleep and um, I went over to wake him up only to realize that his color was starting to change that he wasn't just asleep mm. um, so we got him in the floor and I went and got my aunt she was a nurse and we started doing CPR and stuff on him and he ended up passing away and so I go back home to Harrodsburg and the, I felt so lonely I just cried out to Jesus because he's all that I had I didn't have my husband and the one man that I could call it. He always knew what to do or the right thing to say. He was going to. I said, Lord, I don't have anybody. You're all I have. And you're going to have to show up in the midst of this because I'm really about to give up. And so about that time, um, not long after that, Eddie was arrested and put in jail. Um, I want to come back to Isaiah House first. And I love my little wife's heart and I don't blame her a bit I'm thankful for it to this day she put me in jail <laughs> uh, she saved my life yes. right. which I don't take the glory away from God because again it's, it's a whole different story like I told you all before you know uh, when God knew, knew that it was either putting me in the ground or saving me he put me behind a, uh, a steel door. Mm -hmm. uh, he just used her this time. <laughs> <laughs> but I had asked her. And, and going back, and but there's no... I, I can't even explain it to her. I don't know how to explain it to you all. Uh, how I felt during that time um, when her dad passed because I loved her dad dearly. Uh, her dad and I started growing close because we were finally able to sit down and talk about Scripture together. Uh, and, and, and I felt completely just, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there's no words for how I felt about not being there for her during that time. And not being there for him either. Um, but I did make a choice finally that I was going to go back to the Isaiah house. And... Uh, but by then she had already filed a warrant on me and they were looking for me and, and uh, uh, when I got to the Isaiah house uh, they found out that I was there and they said well we got to pick you up uh, so for what five months for about five months I was in jail and within that five months time about four and a half of it or four of it was spent out here at Boyle County and I know some of you all have probably heard people talk about jailhouse religion before. Well, you can call it what you want. Um, I don't know if I'll call it jailhouse religion as much as I got moved in the Holy Spirit mm. while I was in there. Amen. Um, I finally come to, the, to the, the, the understanding because I didn't know that I didn't know that I was going to get to go back to the Isaiah house. I ultimately got to go back. I didn't know I was going to get to go back. I was hoping and praying because I knew that's where I needed to be. But I finally come to the understanding and I got that peace about me that no matter what happened, God was going to see me through it. Whether I was behind a chain link fence with barbed wire, or whether I was at the Isaiah house, no matter where I was at, he was going to see me through it and he was going to take care of me. Amen. So about five months later, uh, and I just, I need to go into some of this. Uh, I don't know, uh, and I don't know how much time we got left, but there's a big part I want to tell you all here in a minute because it means so much to me. Um, uh, I had to go through three different counties, three different judges, one county to be reinstated twice, another county to be reinstated for the third time 
that I had 15 years hanging in, over me in. And the last time I went before that judge, he said that if I ever come before him again, that I will serve every day of that prison sentence. He didn't like him. <laughs> <laughs> he had plenty of reason not to. Um, but I went through each one of those counties. And God moved each time. Mm -hmm. But He left me in there long enough for me to start to understand some things. And understand really, and I say this kind of reluctantly, um, because relapse is not a bad thing, or not a good thing. But I learned a lot during that period. <coughs> and I, what I learned was that I lost focus. Mm -hmm. So different than Peter stepping out of the boat. Taking his eyes off the Lord. You know, I lost focus. I took my eyes off the Lord and I started to sink. But the other part of that story is he was right there to pull me back out. Amen. And he had done it multiple times over and over and I started to realize that. Because remember I told you I've been arrested 14 times. Mm. So, I get through all those counties. And I go to that last one, and that judge is looking at me, and he, he looks at me, and he said, look, he said, what makes you think that going back to the Isaiah house is going to do anything different? And I didn't know what to say. And I had prayed before I went up there because I knew he would give me an opportunity to speak. And at that point, I would already been told, he is not going to agree to this. You are going to prison. And I had prayed. I said, Lord, just give me the words you want me to say. And when he asked me what I had to say about going back to the Isaiah house, and I told him, I said, Your Honor, I said, you know, I said, I've made a lot of bad decisions in my life. I said, but there's three that I know were right. I said, the first was giving my life over to Jesus. I said, the second one was going to the Isaiah house. I said, the third one is knowing that I need to go back. I said, the Isaiah house didn't mess up. I did. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going to grant this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I breathed a little easier on that ride back to the Isaiah house. Mm -hmm. And because I'd been through that program before, I'd even been an employee there before, I thought I was going to get back there and everything was just going to be a cakewalk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong. Uh, and I, I, I joked with one of the guys there. I said, well, y'all made it hard on me. He's like, you made it hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was blessed enough to go back there. I went through the, pro the entire program again. I got refocused. At that time, Joanna was just pretty upset with me. Uh, and I didn't think that it was ever going to be what we had. Look, we, we had had our family restored. When she went through recovery and I went through the first time, we had been separated for almost four years. And within that 12 month time of us going through recovery and giving our lives to the Lord, I had my wife and all three of my kids, a new home and everything all together up here in Harrodsburg. And I went and messed it all up by taking my eyes off of Jesus. Tell something bad on the So I was I was really I was angry and I fought with the Lord a lot. We had a lot of discussions in my living room. <laughs> and um, I said, I, I'm just gonna file for divorce. I was talking to people, I'm just I'm just gonna file for divorce. I can't I can't do this again. I don't trust that this is not gonna happen again. And so uh, I have done a lot of praying and that's not the way the Lord was leading me, so we argued quite a bit. And uh, I always had my TV on the Christian Network, and I come in from work one day, and there was a testimony on there, and it was this guy, and he was talking to his pastor about marrying him and his fiance, and the pastor wanted to pray about it. When he came back to him, he said, you need to talk to your wife. And he said, I, well, I'm asking you to marry us. And he said, well, that's what I'm getting. You need to talk to your wife. And he said, well, I was married. He said, 10 years ago, but I don't know where she's at. And I haven't talked to her since. 
So the man proceeds to look her up and shows up on her doorstep. And she had never remarried. And they rekindled and end up getting remarried. And I was like, all right, Lord, I hear you plain and clear. I'm going to be obedient even though I'm mad about it. <laughs> so I had to move back home to Harlan County. And my oldest son, he told me, he said, Mom, he said, if you take that back, he said, that will be it. You'll be dead to me. And so Eddie was secretly texting me. And one night I was sitting at my mom's house and the text came through and my son seen it. And he broke down on me and started crying and had a meltdown. Words were exchanged. He was so broken and so hurt because he had totally opened himself up back up to his dad and was devastated. And so at that moment, I had to make a choice between moving back to Harrodsburg to be with my husband and go in the direction the Lord said to go or leave my baby behind knowing that he said he was done with me if I chose that. The last time he ever seen me before that, he told me that he would cut my guts out the next time he seen me. And he meant every word of it. That's and how hurt that child you know, was. Got pretty bad. And so anybody that knows me, my kiddos are my everything. But I made that choice to follow Jesus because I know that his word tells me that he has plans to prosper me. And not to harm me in plan to give me hope in the future. Amen. And so I moved back to Harrodsburg and three months go by and anybody that's a mother knows that's a long three months when you're grieving your children. Mm -hmm. No phone call. And this is the kid that I had when I was 18. So we had been through, we'd grown up together. And um, one day the phone rings and it's him and he says, Mom, um, I'm going to be down that way. Would it be okay if I stopped by? Mm. Sure. I got off the phone and I was like, I felt like the prodigal son was coming home. I've got all this, these groceries and I'm fixing everything. I knew so you loved me. He was up that way to buy a gun. <laughs> and then the devil started, uh, he's coming to show you the gun he's going to use to kill his dad. <laughs> so I was tore up and excited all day long. So he comes and, and Eddie gets off work and has no idea that he's there. He walks through the door and Logan's talking to everybody in the house but not saying much to his dad. And he gets ready to leave and he goes to walk out the door and he looks at him and he says, Bye, Dad. And I knew at that moment that God was stirring something up. Mm, that's right. And um, so today... <laughs> Our family has been restored a second time, and that son is 26 years old. He just moved out. He moved back in with us, and uh, him and his dad got to know a relationship like they've never experienced before. Amen. Amen. So that, I always use that story. That, that, that story is a story of grace. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've been shown grace a lot of times. But I've had my family restored not once, but twice. Mm -hmm. And there ain't one person that can do that. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and that's why I try to never take any of the glory away from what God's done in their life. And I, that's why sometimes I, I worry about these testimonies because you talk so much about all the stuff that you've done and not enough about what God's done. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and, but it, for us, a lot of times, you have to hear what we've been through to understand how far God's come, come through. So... The, the part that I was trying to get at, and I know we're probably getting close on time, um, but I had went back to the Isaiah house, and Joanne had moved back. Everything seemed like it was going good. Um, and I get a letter in the mail from two different courts saying that I've got revocation hearings again. Mm. And I think, how can this be happening? You know, I've done everything I was supposed to do I'm doing everything I spoke, I'm supposed to do, and here this has happened. So I had to go all the way back to Letcher County, the bad one, the one where I've been reinstated for three different times, and go before that judge again. Well, he congratulated me. <laughs> Turns out it was just a review hearing to just make sure that I completed what I was supposed to do. Harlan County wasn't so nice. nice. <laughs> 
So, I have to go to Harlan County about, what, a week after that? And I had become real close with a, with a gentleman in Harrodsburg. We were having Bible studies at our house all the time. I just, I, I, I thought the world of him. He was just a, when me and him could sit down and talk about the Word, I just, I learned so much from him. And, and, and he looked at me a couple days before and he said, do you mind if I go with you? And I was like, no, I don't know. We'll go see the mountains. We'll take you to the mountains. So we take off, head that way. I had worked all night long. And I leave out of Harrodsburg at what, 8 o'clock. So I'm, I'm rushing to get there. I get to Barberville. And I get pulled over. And the police officer proceeds to wrap me up for everything he can possibly find. And I'm thinking, well, here we go. You know what I mean? So it was the, the devil was just trying to come at me so hard that day and take my focus away again. So we get to Harlan County and the courthouse is closed. And I think, are you kidding me? I've worked all night long. I just drove three hours, got 15 tickets <laughs> on the way, and nobody let me know that this courthouse is closed today. Well, it turns out they had a death. Uh, one of the court workers had died, and they had shut the court courthouse down. So I was like, look, i got to get this taken care of while I'm here. So I go over to the county attorney's office. They're closed. And I think... <laughs> <laughs> so I tell my wife because my mom met us down there I tell her and my mom uh, I said look I said let's go out because we had to drive a little ways I said let's go out to the public defender's office I said and see if I can catch somebody out there and get this took care of so we get in the car she rides with my mom her and my daughter ride with my mom and uh, the guy that was with us rides with me and when we get in the car, I turn around and I look at him. I said, you know what? And I said, this is the story of my life. Mm. And there's a point behind that. So we get out to the public defender's office and they're open. And I walk in. I thought, okay, I'm going to get this straightened out. Everything will be done. Go back home when everything's done. Walk in. And I just went to Letcher County where it was so bad the week before. Worried to death. And it turned out it was nothing. And I get to Harlan County thinking, okay, well, this ain't going to be anything either. It's just the same situation. And when I sat down in front of this gentleman's desk, he proceeds to look at me and Joanna and said, you're going to prison. They're revoking you. But about the end, God showed up. There was a lady popped her head in the door and said, what did you say your name was? I said, Lee Early. She said, wasn't well, you at Ledger County last week? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she handed the attorney something. She said, here, this was in your box. She said, I didn't know if you'd seen it or not. And he pulls that letter op open and starts to read, and read it. And he says, uh, the Commonwealth versus Lee Early, uh, revocation, uh, revocation hearing dismissed. So God showed up. <laughs> In a big, big way. Yeah. So the times that I talked about being in a jail cell and, and God showing up and things happening in certain ways, you know, it's times you don't see that. Mm -hmm. It's when you really focus on the Lord and, 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 right. and you become obedient and your faith starts to grow. You start to see how God has really worked in your life, not just recently, mm -hmm. but for years. Amen. Mm -hmm. So that whole statement when I got in the car, and I told that gentleman, I said, you know what, this is the story of my life. That wasn't true. The story of my life is that every time that I needed God, He was right there. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's right. He showed up in a big way. Mm -hmm. But there's another part of that too, and I thought about that after I've told this a few times. You know, God didn't show up. He's always there. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I just had to reach up, reach up and grab Him. Right. That was the difference. I had to cry out. Amen. So, 
Everything's good now. <laughs> All right, God's good. We live a blessed life. Uh, we've got two beautiful grandbabies. Uh, our three kids. Uh, all our kids are blessed. We're blessed. Uh, we're blessed to be able to work out at the Isaiah House and try to give back to, to others that have struggled and gone through similar situations as this. Uh, and uh, Joanna wants to say she's my better half, but God's my better half. <laughs> He's my better whole. <laughs> this is a better way to say that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are blessed in every form or fashion. Amen. 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 And how can you hear a testimony like this and not believe that there is a God? Amen. 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 so good. Too. So all all the so I said, if, if y'all want to break out in revival, we'll go through our whole testimony. Because <laughs> we'd be here for a week. <laughs> that would be take, great. It, take that long. Uh, but there is, there's, there's a lot of other things that we didn't bring up. Look, I've died twice. I've, overd I've overdosed twice. Uh, uh, there's other things that Joanna's went through. There's tons. <laughs> our, our testimony goes on for days. And, but the good part is, is our testimony keeps growing every day. Amen. Amen. And now it's growing with things that you want to sit and talk right. about. You Amen. want to talk about. You want to brag about. Amen. Uh, the, the thing is, is I don't like, I, I don't, I don't mind talking about my past. I'm not ashamed of my past. I'm not proud of my past. But the only way that people know how far God's brought me is to hear about my past. That's, right. That's true. That's right. And He's pulled me out of some dark, dark places. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've got a song in the church that they've been singing here lately. Uh, one of the lines you know, says that He's a, he's a light in the darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, Amen. There's been some very dark nights and dark days that he was the only ray of light that that, that I could see. And, and I'm thankful. I'm thankful for everything that I've ever been through, everything that he's brought me through, and everything that he gives me.